evening, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Welcome. Thank you so very much for being with us. I'm Kim Serafini, the founder, creator, and CEO of Positive Prime Technology. And it's my honor, it really is my honor to be chatting today with J.W. Wilson. What a delight we have in store for you. This man is extraordinary, and I don't use that word lightly. I mean, he's literally extra, phenomenally, over and above ordinary or normal. He is brilliant. He's also compassionate. He's a visionary. He's been very successful thus far in life, and we're going to dive into some stories about how he became who he really is right now. And I absolutely want to have this rich and delicious conversation about his book. His book is all about the learning code. And much more importantly, it's about breakthroughs. So you're here for a very valuable and enjoyable conversation. Relax, take a nice big deep breath in through your nose and slowly breathe out through your mouth. And allow yourself to now take all of this in. So JW, thank you for being here. I would love for you to share with the audience a little bit more about who you really are. You don't want to know that. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd be glad to. And just what you said in the morning, listen, I'm not really necessarily all those things you said. What I've been able to do is pull people together that have helped build something pretty wonderful. And I've been a piece of the puzzle, really. Um, I don't see myself kind of that egoic self. But... Uh, uh, what we've been able to do is really, as you say, pretty dramatic. What we've done is, I mean, just go a little bit of the history. When we go back and look at how we've created learning in the past, if you go into a classroom today or a corporate training today or a webinar today, it's very similar what happened to people in Greek times in 350 B.C., when they went to listen to Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates, which at the time made a lot of sense. At the time, all the way up until the Middle Ages, up until, I shouldn't say, around 1200 BC, about AD, uh, about the start of the time that the, the Christian church became strong and we had the church schools. Up until then, do you know how many things you had to know to know just about everything that existed? 3,000. So you could memorize it in 18 years. That's what the monks were doing. That's what we we're doing in these religious schools. You could use a system of memorization to really, we didn't have much. We had the stirrup and the spur and you know the plow. That was about it. You know, There wasn't a lot of technology out there. There wasn't a lot of transformation. It's estimated back in those days, information was doubling about once every somewhere 1,000 to 1,500 years in the world. Do you know how fast information is doubling now? About once every 12 months. Oh, so, well, I was going to say about once every 12 hours. I think about the amount I consume now compared to the amount people in their 50s consumed 30 years ago or 50 years ago. And it's just, it's, it's quite breathtaking. Yeah, really, there's some estimations that our brains are heavier than they were you know, 100, 200 years ago, because learning is really physical structure, not only integration, but the addition of neurons and synapses. So the more you learn, in a way, the heavier your brain is. So you're exactly right. So what we found is that the system that we used in a time when information doubled every thousand years, when in a world where information is doubling every, whether it's 12 minutes or 12 or, or, or 12 months can't work it's literally what you're trying to do is it's like trying to drive a model t in an indianapolis 500 race you're not going to win so the, and it's a it's and the problem is that um what we found is that when you use what we call ancient learning theory in in today's times what you can do is literally damage the brain so 
This is why 70%, I, talk, I was just talking in another webinar, 70% of us are overweight in the world, right? Yet everybody knows calories make them fat. That did nothing to make them thin. So literally the information alone did not cause the transformation. Why is that? It's not that the information was bad. It was the system of information deliberately was not causing neurological change, structural change that then dictates your behaviors, your thoughts and your actions to change. So what, we, what, we, what, we, what we've done at the Institute for the last 35 years, we went back and reverse engineered the 6,000 genes that must be turned on to cause neurological change that changes the shape of your brain so the shape of your life transforms. Um, JW, do you know how many of those 6,000 genes is the proportion? Like what's the total number of genes? There's about 19, depending on the expert of the day, we're just getting it there. There's a there's the uh, the genome product that they, we used to think there was a hundred thousand genes. I don't know if you remember these guys named Watson Crick Crick uh, Crick and Watson. They basically figured out the double helix of the DNA. We used to think there were a hundred thousand genes. The reason we thought there were so many genes was because we thought there was one gene for one function of the brain. But what we found is there's really only about nineteen thousand genes. And when these genes and these genes are polygenetic which mean one gene talks to another gene that talks to another gene that talks to another gene. It's a very complex system. We used to think of it being very linear. You turn on this gene and you get this response. You turn on this gene and you get stress response, but it's more complex than that. So even though there's about 18,000, 19,000 genes in, throughout our whole body that control everything from digestion to your toenail growth, um, they all interact. And what we found was there are probably about 6,000 that control neurological function. And if those, a percentage of those genes aren't turned on in the right way, you can't get the neural structure to change that creates the behavior change. And this is kind of what you're doing at Positive Prime. You're turning on really and off some of those genes that are causing the bad stuff. You know, genes can cause bad stuff as well as good stuff, right? So. What you're, what you're doing at a very, very deep level, and I'm, I'm, I'm only going a quarter of an inch deep here for all of the neuroscientists that are wa watching this so everybody can understand it. But if we want people to change, we have to change the expression of their genes so they, that, that expression could change their brain structure. Absolutely, so hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, so what we did for the last 35 years was not only go into the research of figuring out what those genes were and how to turn them on. But more importantly, we looked at what kind of systems work most effectively to accelerate that whole process of neurological growth so we can have faster learning, motivation, and behavior change in our lives. Well, given the state of the world and our moment in time, you and I are absolutely on the same page about acceleration. You know, it was about 20 years ago, I realized that if I was bouncing on a mini rebounder whilst I was watching um, something that was fascinating in terms of a documentary, I would actually find that I was being efficient doing two things at once. And I was drawn to the rebounder because of the way that it accelerates the acquisition of fitness or the retention of your fitness levels. And it's an incredibly fast way for our bodies to actually move the lymphatic system. And I have been on a mission for 20 years to figure out how everything else in my life can be 10 minutes on a rebounder instead of an hour running, right? So uh, that actually is part of the reason why positive prime sessions are as they are. It's I want to be able to consume the very essence of the key messages of great books or great programs and courses. And I want to be able to do that in a way that's really quite elegant, enduring and fast. It needs to be swift and quick. We Maybe it's because I was so impatient. I was driven <laughs> to figure this out. So you've actually, you've, 
crack the code on accelerated learning. And I think I've created one way to facilitate that. So let me just say one way. Let me just say something. We're really not accelerating learning. We're activating structures that let you learn like you're supposed to. The other programs we've got are decelerating learning. So wow. let me go. Yeah. So so we think about it. Think of all those things that not only you, but everybody watching this, this webinar, think how many things you memorized in high school and college. At the most, you remember three to five percent at the most, which means you forgot 98 to 95 percent. So nobody looks at it this way. We've developed a system that literally helps you forget 95% of what you try to learn. I mean, that's, when you look at it from a systems analysis viewpoint, there's a, a guy at MIT called Peter Senge, Senge, who works on system dynamics, how systems interact. And we did an awful lot of research into his, his work um, at MIT. And what we found was that what, what we, we haven't looked at the brain and learning as how to activate a complex system to create simplistic and, qu and quick change. So what we've done is we've built systems that don't create the change we want to change to have happen. In other words, you know, 60% of us in America aren't very happy and 70% of us are living paycheck to paycheck. That's not a great system of success, right? And so what we, we went back and looked at not really what's wrong with the existing system. What we went back and at, it started at the very beginning said, how do you create and learn? Because we didn't do that. We just kept replicating what Plato and Aristotle were doing 350 years before Christ. And you can't use that system today when information's doubling so quickly. I would love to understand if we can just go back a little bit and provide some extra context. How is it that you became the person who is fascinated by the way that we learn and even imagined that there could be an optimal way to learn in this day and age? Um, so I'm dyslexic, I'm ADHD. And uh, I've got PTSD. <laughs> so I've got all the initials, right? And so when I was in school, I was very hyperactive. Um, I spent most of my, I was telling somebody, I spent from the first grade until sixth grade writing on the board after school, I will not, whatever I had done. Pull Peggy's, you know, pigtails, shoot Danny Reed in the ear with a paper clip, whatever I was doing, right? And, um, the reason why was my brain plan didn't fit the system, right? And so what I found was the only way that they could try to control my brain plan was through a reward or punishment. And the research on reward and punishment, there's a guy at DC at University of Rochester who does research on reward and punishment. And you know what happens, how good reward and punishment helps at getting people to learn? Not very well at all. The recidivism rate at prisons are 70 to 80 percent. So did the freaking did the punishment help? No, they just went back out and did it. It didn't change the brain structures. So what we found is that you nearly needed a system of transformation to change the brain structures. And information alone wasn't it. It's the reason that I was just telling in the last webinar, the reason you don't remember your last history class but you do remember your first kiss, right? And so what was the difference between the two? Well, in very simplistic states, the, the kiss was more meaningful than your last history class. Of course, you're, unless you're a you know, history professor watching this. And then second of all, the kiss fired more neurons. And there's a, 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 the basic learning rule in neurobiology is the heavy and synaptual learning rule which basically means the more neurons that fire, the more learning that happens. So the last history class fired a few neurons in your left upper lobe, a few thousand. That few first kiss fired millions and billions of synaptical buds, and that's why you remember. But we don't build systems 
based on this more process driven system where you're not just memorizing information. Wow. I would love to know, friend to friend, what your best piece of advice would be for me so that I can experience more peace and enjoy this journey of life more fully. What would you tell me to do or what is one of the paradigms or thought processes that you would hope that I would internalize? Okay, so if I'm gonna ask you that question, so let me ask you this question. What is causing you the most stress in your life right now? Wow, there's a myriad of things. Um, <laughs> like most of us, it's not one thing, right? <laughs> yeah. So it would definitely, it would, right this very moment, it would be that I've just had a biopsy on my head and the doctor put a dressing here and I'm self-conscious because we're on video. Um, it might be that I had a cardiac um, pacemaker implanted last year because I was having episodes of unconsciousness and my heart was completely stopping as the tech inside my chest was indicating. And um, once you get past 10 seconds of your heart not beating, you start to get into some pretty serious trouble. And my heart hadn't beat. There hadn't been one beat for 20 plus seconds. And that's when they decided, mm, we need to put a pacemaker in there. But they didn't even know why my heart was doing that. So often I will have this moment of what is actually really going on in my mind? What is actually really going on in my heart? What is actually really going on in my autonomic nervous system? And why don't they know? And what is it that I can be doing? So there are moments and they're like, they're, they're milliseconds where I might be concerned or worried about what the long-term outcomes are. And then I calm myself down and think, stay in the moment. There's only joy and cheerfulness and exuberance and optimism and I'm fabulous and my body is miraculous and I will heal completely and fully. And then I suppose, you know, there's also some other stresses when I'm working way too intensively. <laughs> I think, whoops, I'll, I better change my way so that I can actually focus on my spouse. Otherwise, he's going to have a serious attention deficit disorder from me and we're going to be in strife. Um, you know this one. Our, our significant others, they need our time and our attention and our energy for the romance and intimacy. So like when I say a myriad of things, I'm serious. There can be a myriad of things that can be stressing me out. Okay, let's go back. So, so all your thoughts, your actions, and your behaviors, I don't have it next to me. I, I, was, I, I just ran in the door here for this meeting. But normally, I have a piece of cheese, a piece of cheddar cheese. And basically, your neurons are made out of fats. And your synapses, the little buds that are on the, the, the dendritic branches, dendritic branches, they are synapses. Basically, they hold the learning. So your past learning is very much like cheddar cheese. It's thick, gooey stuff. And what happened to you from birth and really even in, in the womb and believe it or not, even at conception, what was happening to you all the way through, even up until now, was literally creating synaptical connections and neuronal connections and new neurons in your brain that are dictating all your thoughts, all your actions and all your behaviors. So it's this thick, gooey stuff. And when we're under stress, what happens is the stress literally cements the cheese. It turns it in from cheddar cheese to Parmesan cheese, and it's hard to change it. So the great, this is, and what does the school system do? It may, does anybody make it through the school system without being in stress every day? Absolutely worried not. About, worried about your tests, worried about your grades, worried about your diploma. So literally we have a, our, our whole educational system is like stress hormones on steroids. And so what the educational system is doing for a moderate of reasons, tons of different reasons, which we can get into, is they're taking a child that is just beautiful and, uh, and, and natural 
and joyful and learns incredibly quickly naturally. And then we drop him into a system that says, no more doing what is joyful to you to learn. We're gonna teach you how to learn now. Think about this. By the time you were, went into first grade in Australia, when do you go into first grade? How old? Woo. I don't know, actually, I was living in Papua New Guinea on the equator. Um, I think that you're about five or six when you go to school okay. here in Australia. Like this, around six years old, basically up until you're six you've got about fifteen thousand connections per neuron you and i only have five thousand connections per neuron so as a child it's like a sponge it's sucking the information in and it's su it how and, and it su sucks the information in on a protocol the protocol is it sucks the information in that matches your existing brain structures so let me start over so, or start at the beginning. So there's 7.5 billion of us on the face of the earth. No two neurons in any two brains are wired in the exact same way. We were born that way. We were born with a gift that none of the other 7.5 billion of us on the face of the earth have. And what that means is that literally our neurological, our, our, our brains are like sponges when the information is meaningful to us and hits that particular, what we call your meaning network. Those neurons that were wired specially for you as your gift. So when you're a child, you learn between, think about this, 30,000 and 100,000 words before you're seven. Why do you learn those words? You didn't memorize them, you didn't study them, you didn't even know how to read. How did you learn those? You learned them because they helped you get more of what was meaningful to you that stimulated the structures that were your gift. Some kids are musical dominant. I had a musical dominant son that was playing the drums and the bugle and everything and the guitar in the basement, everything, you know, when he was five years old, you know, I had another one that was doing art. So basically these, this gift that you have is gonna have you go into your world and whatever, whenever you fire that gift, that locus of neurons, it's really not in one place, it's spread over, but to make it simple, it, look at it as being in one place. When you fire that locus of neurons, that's your gift. Dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, um, acetylcholine, all these neural transmitters come out that allow, you to, that allow your brain to literally sec select an information that wants you to get more of that. And what do we do? We use the words because we have a, and you broke a warning to your left temporal lobe, we can speak words. We learn words so we can get more of what's meaningful to us. And so- JW, I love what you are saying. I absolutely, I, I love what you are saying. Can I just interrupt and say, so how is it that we decide what's meaningful to us? And I'll tell you what's triggering for me is that the Positive Prime software allows you to upload photographs that get basically placed randomly amongst the standard content in a particular activity or experience that we call a Positive Prime session, right? And we advise all of our beautiful community members to make sure that they upload photographs that are meaningful and significant to them such that their identity then wraps around the all the other content the content of course that you, is quite frankly what you're actually learning and what what is leading to your accelerated change i've never heard anyone explain it quite like you do and it's exquisite absolutely exquisite and so back to how do we as well, human beings let me get come back to this, what is this, meaningful these, how, sorry yeah, so that group, that locus of neurons that you've got that nobody else has makes something meaningful to you. You may be a musical dominant, but some guy may want to be a musical dominant with a trumpet and somebody else with a trombone, right? It Basically, it's a little different because our species is an orchestra. It's an orchestra that tries to use our different intelligences to, to make the most beautiful music we can. But let's go back to that seven-year-old or six-year-old. He's been self-stimulating his learning. He hasn't been reading books. To, to, he hasn't been going to school. He hasn't been doing any of that, you know, to, to, to learn. He's been learning 
the things that help him stimulate the group of locus of neurons in his brain that give that are there that give him meaning, joy, and fulfillment. So that's what babies are doing. Is if, unless they're unless they you know wet their diapers or they're hungry, they're not crying. They're basically selecting information and learning all the time. But now we take this wonderful, joyful, natural process where you're in the world, you're moving through time and space. You were talking about jumping on that trampoline. Your body needs to be involved. So now the, the kid's body was involved. He was doing all those things to learn what he was learning, whether it was playing soccer or whatever. And then what we say is, no, 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 Tommy. No, 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 Peggy. You, you sit in that chair. We don't want you to move for the next 12 to 16 years. We want you to sit there and listen to me talk to you. And, and then what we want you to do is not do what's meaningful to you. Do what's meaningful to me and our system. And then when you come out of it, you're going to be okay. But when we come out of it, we're not okay. At some level, we've been damaged. Because what's happened is they literally shut down those neurological structures that were meaningful to us, that were giving us all that joy, you get 20 watts of power through your carotid and vertebral artery, that's naturally going to your hip. So what we do to those children is we say, sit in that chair and we can, we're going to redirect that blood flow from your gift. And we're going to send it to your left temporal lobes where words and finite math are. So what do you think happens to that locus of neurons that was your gift? It atrophy. It atrophies. And so now you spend all this time in this classroom and you've studied your butt off. You increase your stress hormones. So, you know, there's, there's some of this that are, the school system does work, but, but those are the ones that have the locus of neurons in their left temporal lobe. When I speak to teachers and I say, who got good grades in school? You know what percent raised their hand? 100. 95 percent. The, the physics teachers and the phys ed teachers don't. They've got a different brain plan. But when I talk to entrepreneurs, you know what percent raise their hand? Like us? Zero. No. Five, we were five, rebels. Five to seven percent, right? Right. Think about it. So you've got the entrepreneurs changing the world, and none of them, they didn't do well in the education system. So... Yeah, and most of these guys, you take Jobs, Wozniak, Dell, Alan Gates, Ted Turner, you know, Richard Branson. Richard Branson didn't even finish high school. So yeah. none, none of those people finished college because they self-selected out of the system because it wasn't meaningful enough to them. Now, they didn't do it consciously. They did it subconsciously, which and is okay. And the shame is they ended up, maybe if they're a little like me, with a self-esteem problem because they thought that they weren't disciplined enough to study at a perfect pace instead of cram the night before, completely stress themselves out. And yet, I mean, there's no doubt I'm extraordinarily intelligent, but I never, ever understood that in the entire of my schooling, including when I went to university and actually graduated with a degree, right? I ended just, up feeling just, bad about myself just, because I couldn't study like everybody else. And it wasn't everybody else. It's that five to seven percent. And then what we do is we say, oh, you're an A student, you're a B student, you're a C student, you're an F student. And then what we do is we start separating us when what nature wants us to do is work together. Mm. So, so the system itself deconstructs evolutionary biology that says the way to save save our species is to have us all work together to save our species even again calls in here so because we have this lack of understanding of the neurobiology of how we learn we continue to build systems that create less much much less than desired results and people in the world that are less than happy or joyful or fulfilled Mm, mm. So, JW, um, we at Positive Prime and with some of our awesome team members like Patty and Mayumi, we created this, um, what we call a session, that helps to reinforce the main messages of your book. So it's taken um, a Herculean effort for you to actually birth this book. Um, 
I would love to know if you're going to say to me, Kim, you've got to read this book. Tell me why. Well, the good part is you don't have to read the whole thing. It's a little large. But the way we've written it is so any schmo can read it. You don't have to understand. This is this is this is designed for the average guy. Um, it's not designed for the scientists. What I did was we or just me, I've got a very big team. We went back in and reverse engineered the science so anybody can understand it. And really, after the first three chapters, you only need to read five to seven pages of any chapter to get enough to understand why meaning is important to you, why you need to learn concepts before details. You know, there's there's certain things that we, why learning is a selective process, not an instructive one. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that we need to understand at a really superficial level. And even at a superficial level, we go, oh my God, this is incredible. But the way we wrote it is, if you need more in a topic on meaning, or emotions or any of those, you can go as deep as you want. And as we go deeper, we get deeper into the science. What a lot of people do is read the book once, just read the first five pages of every chapter, and then almost use it kind of as a reference manual. They go, oh, I need to do this in business, or I need to do this in my, in my personal life. So it's really two things in one. And we wrestled a lot with that. People wanted us to write 10 books for the first one, to do the science, you know, do like an encyclopedia learning. And we, 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 we settled on this. So really, you don't have to work very hard. If you read four or five pages a day of this book, of these first parts of these chapters, you're never going to look at learning again. No, none of the organizations we worked with, we worked with over 50 organizations to, with, with this information, training groups um, and educational institutions. And once they see this, you never go back to doing it the old way again, because the old way doesn't work the way we want to. Now we've got a basis to which to understand what creates learning, motivation and behavior change in ourselves, our children and our world. And now we've got a manual. And so what I would suggest is anybody that's watching this and wants to make a difference, they can go to our website too, thelearningcode.com. We have tons of videos up there they can look at and see how it's done. But if they get the book and just slowly go through it without stress, that's the key, then they're going to start changing slowly, slowly, slowly. And then their ability to learn is going to accelerate dramatically. And then their fulfillment and joy in life is going to accelerate dramatically. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I would love to show the audience uh, your positive prime session. And I'd love for us to talk about how and why it brings the messages to life and actually allows us to plant these seeds in the superconscious and what actually happens when we speed it up and slow it down. So I'm going to um, share the screen for a moment. And um, uh, here we have effectively not a movie, not a video and not a slideshow, even though it may seem like it is, it's its own um, proprietary formula inside a proprietary player and we press play and it's ordered every single one of the frames in a sequence but if we press play again a second time it reshuffles all of the let's call them flashcards and you see them in a different order and sequence which will help you to make completely different connections to the content. Um, we have over 800 images that and as we know, an image is worth a thousand words. And so what we're really doing is reinforcing those of those main messages. Um, the actual experience does have music. And you might be able to hear that or you might not, but I'll just mute it whilst we're talking. And if I absolutely love this piece of content, this Positive Prime session within Positive Prime, I can love it and it'll go into my collection and so jw while we're watching this what do you want people to know as a result of viewing this session and reading your book what do you want them to actually know about themselves about life about what's possible right so excuse me let me just turn this up a 
I want to make sure we're getting this. I can see better on my computer than I can on my phone. So what's happening is we, we when so let's go back to what's going on. So what is positive prime really doing neurologically is the question, right? So here's the problem. Have you ever tried to tell your husband to stop doing X that he's done for 20 years? And does he do it? No. You know, trying to get people to change their behaviors is really difficult. Why? This is something we never discuss. Because here's what's happened. It's called your winning strategy. My friend Robert Kiyosaki, a rich dad, poor dad fame, uses this term all the time. Um, what is your winning strategy? Well, a lot of people's winning strategy is, is, is a failure strategy. But the deal is it worked once. So I have a friend of mine who's been married five times to the same person twice. And she, you know what her job is? relationship expert now what's going on there right how is that well what happened what happened is that we, she hit on a strategy when she was young when she had 15,000 connections per neuron that built fats and proteins like cheddar cheese that are now going forward going to dictate all her thoughts all her actions and all her behaviors and because they were successful at one time, we rely on them at a different time. When we're a different age, we're in a different world, we're in a different place. So what's, what the problem is, is that what we're doing is we're trying to get somebody to change without understanding the neurobiology of change. And this is why psychology has such a hard time getting people to change. Now, there's some things they do really well. But in general, I got a friend of mine who's going to the same psychiatrist for 15 years. But, you, you know, what? So, so what happens is this old history of yours is made out of this cheddar cheese. And what happens is when I poke the cheese, try to get you to change, the cheese pokes back and say, we're not going to change. This helped me survive up till now. And even if their life is miserable, their biology says, well, we're alive, aren't we? And so what happens is your biology thinks this is a good strategy, even though you as a human aren't happy, you're not fulfilled, you're not joyful, and you're not successful as you'd like to be. So we've got a real problem that the systems we've used to try, we call it melt your cheese, don't do that. Because the minute you poke the cheese, the cheese pokes back. And just everybody watching this, think about all the people you've tried to change in your life by you telling them something that never changed. Most people don't change because you tell them to change. They can't because the minute you poke the cheese, it pokes back, it hardens up. So what you've done at Positive Prime, and this is why these subliminal programs are at, at one level so interesting to explore is because if you've been having difficulties in your life succeeding or being as joyful as you want to, by coming directly at it, your biology is saying, no, 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 no. It got us here. I'm 40 years old or I'm 30 years old or I'm 60 years old. I'm here, baby. This stuff worked. I'm not going to try something new. So what you've done is you've kind of gone under the cheese. And what Positive Prime does, this is why your music and all the pieces are important, is, and this is where we got to understand learning. We think that putting people under stress causes learning. Well, it can for very short periods of time, but for anything longer than a little bit of time, it corrupts learning. I don't know if you know the research on um, eyewitness accounts of accidents or violence. They're yeah, they really, honestly, they can't recall the details very accurately at all. They record them wrong. The guy says, oh, it was a green car that hit the, hit the little girl in the street coming from the right guy. No, it's a blue car coming from the left. So what happened? Why did that learning get corrupted? The learning got corrupted because it caused stress. The, the top of the adrenal gland gives off a hormone called cortisol. It goes into the brain and literally scrambles the learning. And think about it. Did you ever get ready for a test or take a test when you weren't under stress? No. 
So literally the process that we've got to try to create learning is from a neurobiological standpoint, impeding the very learning that we want people to do. So what you've done at Positive Prime is that you basically are, is, are dipping down into these, what we call alpha, theta, and delta, these slower waveforms. Change doesn't necessarily happen, you know, when you're in beta, I'm going to change, I'm going to do this tomorrow, I'm going to be different, you know. That's a, what's called beta state. The waves are going really quickly, 30 uh, beats a second. They're just going really, really fast. These slower waveforms, alpha, theta, delta, they start going to much slower waveforms, you know, seven cycles a second, even down to a half a cycle a second. When we drop into these, these lower waveforms, how does this happen that the brain can do that? Well, the way the brain can do that is it drops into alpha and theta states, which increases, um, excuse me, it increases acetylcholine, which basically melts your old cheese. It's these meditative states. The reason so many people are meditating, using mindfulness, separating themselves from their ego, is it slows down. It, it slows down, or, or I should, it, it, it basically slows the brain down. But what it does is at the same time, it melts the old cheese. And if you don't melt the old cheese, you can't import new cheese because there's no room, right? So what you have to do first before you say, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna change, is develop a system, a strategy that increases uh, this acetylcholine neurotransmitter that allows the old cheese to melt and allows you to select in more information at a fast rate. That's why acetylcholine is one of the primary neurotransmitters that leads you up to a REM sleep. Um, and so what happens in REM sleep is you make all these incredible connections you couldn't make before. And when you come out of it, you come up with these great ideas of transformation. When I looked at the research and I looked at all the great discoveries that were made in mankind, I couldn't find one that was made in beta waveform state. When we go, 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 go. You know, uh, uh, Newton was laying on a, uh, on a mountain and a, 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 an apple fell from a tree and he went, oh my heavens, grab it. You know, same thing with, same thing with uh, um, a, a lot of really famous people. If you look at what they did and look at their history, the benzene molecule, uh, the printing press, you know, the guy who did the printing press, Gutenberg, um, he went into a meditative state and he said, a Minerva broke, broke forth from my brain. I, I saw a wine press and they had a thing called a stamp and a wine press and I could see how to put words on the page. It wasn't this, this, this. So when we go into these more meditative states, these more slower wave states, acetylcholine goes up, stress hormone goes down. And both of one, we start, the primary thing that we're doing here is melting the old cheese. And what you're doing with the words that are attached to these, these subliminal messages is even that they can't read them, they're picking them up at another level. That's a lot, and this is the theory behind it. They're picking it up at another level that's going in beneath the cheese. You get what I'm saying? So Absolutely. now we're literally to reconstruct the method by which you create a brain that easily transforms so you can get what you want in life. Mm, absolutely. Um, absolutely. You know, you were talking about all these great inventors and as an inventor of Positive Prime Sessions, I can tell you, I literally have this synergistic combination of many ideas come to settle in my mind that allowed me to actually create this in walking meditations. And um, I have, you know, quite frankly, taken my time out and gone on a retreat in places like Bali. I also live in a very, very, very peaceful, beautiful area in a regional area by the beach in Australia on the East Coast in this you know, paradise we call the Sunshine Coast in the state of Queensland. And I deliberately live here because it allows me to connect with source and it allows me enough space and peace 
serenity and harmony so that I can be the kind of person who can actually come up with these kinds of ideas and then have enough tenacity to bring it to life, right? But most people don't, they don't understand they must take time in retreat. So let me stop saying, see, we call it tenacity or grit. That's not what it was. You were following what was meaningful to you. So you can deal with the higher the meaning, the more you can deal with adversity. Sure. So what we, I, so I saw a TED talk on, on grit once that, you know, a million people watched. Wonderful. Angela TED Duckworth. Talk. It's actually pretty famous research from the University of Pennsylvania. She's become quite famous because of that TED talk. Yes. But, but the interesting thing was that they didn't identify what grit was. Because what they think is grit is you're the tough guy. You can meditate through. Look, I'm not a tough guy. You're not a tough guy. What you did was you just followed what was meaningful to you. And it looks Absolutely. like grit. It, Absolutely. At some, level, at some level, we didn't have a choice. Once we found what's meaningful to you, you'll walk through fire to get where you're going to go. Oh, hello, I'll have six cardiac arrests and go unconscious and smash my head, and but I'll still continue. And it's why passion, you know, all of these people who don't know what their passions is, and I kind of, my heart aches for them because I think if only you had this really noble cause. I mean, JW, talk about these noble causes. Like, I, I'm committed to Positive Prime and to sharing it because I know that, Feeling brighter and being brighter is so juicy and fabulous. And I, of course, want that for millions of people on the planet. And so I'll just keep going. I'll just keep going. It, yeah, you, it, I can't help it. I mean, you know, the truth is, if you look at how I got here, you know, I developed 25 startups. I used all that money and put it in here. It doesn't look like it was simple. But, or it looked like it was difficult, but at some level, it was always meaningful. Mm. So the difficulty in the pain didn't influence me as it would if it wasn't meaningful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, and so what we, what we, it, so if we've got a system that don't help children figure out what's meaningful to them. Most of us adults try I don't know, I think it's now five to seven jobs, we'll have to 12 jobs we'll have in our life before we die. I mean, it used to be one job, right? And, you know, you got a pension and then you die. But, and then you hated that job too. But now, but now we're trying all these different jobs and we're still not getting happy because we don't really know what's meaningful to us because the system that helped us to develop meaning has been corrupted. Mm. Okay, so JW, um, let's let's help the audience to understand a few things about why the Positive Prime sessions are helping to melt the cheese and bring about the change. Um, from your research, why is it so important that we personalize it? And of course, that you can see, for me, it's of course my own name because we're logged into my account. So I, I keep seeing Kim Serafini, Kim Serafini flash up. What happens when the content you were or the subject. Pardon? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I said, I thought, I thought I kept seeing, I hadn't seen it with Kim. Kerf. I saw what you made for me, but I hadn't seen your name in it before. I go, man, she's, not, she's, she's sublimity and you make all these people love her. So that's just your program. I get it. <laughs> yeah. So for anybody so else. When, when you get it, you, Right. When you get the Positive Prime program, your name's in there. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And, right. and so, JW, help me to understand and the audience to understand from your perspective. I know why we have personalization, but I would love to hear when you see that and you know that for every person who watches your Positive Prime session from within their own account, they'll actually see their own name. Why is that important? Well, let's go back. So the first thing that's happening is I can, so the biggest problem we got with the school system is increasing stress hormone over long periods, years and years, not just a few hours. After 20 minutes, there's great research. After 20 minutes, stress hormone, cortisol in your brain 
can literally start to fry neurons. So we've got an educational system that puts everybody under stress. And we wonder why the, our, our hospital systems aren't working as hard as we want, as well as we want to. But we put these poor you know, interns and people in medical school, it's a, like a stress factor. So we're knocking the learning out all the time. And so, I mean, you talk to doctors and they'll tell you all the stuff they memorize, all the classes they went, if they're going to be honest, they'll tell you how little they really remember. And those are the guys operating on us. Now, if they've got a lot, a lot of meaning in it, they selected it in natural. But let's go back. So what you've developed here are two things. One, something that goes underneath the cheese that is telling, that has kept you alive up till now, but not very successfully. So you're going underneath it. The second thing is there's no tests, there's no memorization, there's no classes, there's no judgment, there's no A, B, C, D, F, you're, there's nobody looking over your shoulder, your stress hormones are on the floor, which is great, you're, but you need enough to learn, but they're not killing you. And then what, what happens is you, as you go into these slower wave states, I'm raising acetylcholine that allows me to select the information into like what's happening, kind of creating new structures. So you've got this wonderful environment that you've created that is low stress um, and I don't have to really do much. All I have to do is be one with what's happening at the moment. I don't have to memorize any of these words or do anything. I'm just letting them come in. You've got some music behind them, which also helps me relax. There's, there's, there was a thing called the Mozart uh, effect, which the research didn't prove it, but the idea is that certain music for certain of us really accelerate our ability to select it in. And so, so what you've got is all these pieces in place. And now I can just look at it and I don't have to have any expectations. I can just be one with the beautiful pictures. And then the words come in underneath and start because now my brain's gone into these slower waveforms driven by acetylcholine. Now my old cheese starts to melt, which is the first part. Now you're starting to throw in some words about who I am or want to be in the world. And those words, now I start to slowly seep in, like taking that dye. Let's say you got a bucket of purple dye and I have a cloth. I used this analogy earlier. You got a, 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 a white cloth. You dip it in the purple dye. I pull it out and it's just a little, a little pink. I dip it in again, it's a little more purple. Every time I dip it in, it gets a little more purple. And eventually it's the same color as the dye that I want the cloth to be. So if we want to be more compassionate, more loving, more peaceful, all the things, what you're doing with the words is you're slowly taking the white cloth and dipping it in the dye into a and to allow the brain in, a, in somewhat of an altered, what we would call altered state, not LSD altered state, but an altered state from the traditional learning platform that basically allows the brain to literally slowly change over time. And that's why it's going to depend on somebody's biology and their history and how dense their cheese is. After they watch this for a period of time and one time a day or twice a day or whatever they want to do, eventually, their brain is going to become more of the color of what they're getting from these more subliminal um, messaging that's wrapped in to the softer music, the pictures, and all the other things that are happening. And most importantly, it's not stressful. It's relaxing. And there's no judgment. In the formula... One of the things that we do is a certain ratio of what we call Duchenne smiles. And we know from the research that when your eyes and the retina in your eyes sees a smile, particular type of warm, genuine, sincere, honest smile, the mirror neurons in your brain are activated and stimulated by you seeing that Duchenne smile. And then, of course, the messages are sent to the endocrine system and hormonally we start to produce more serotonin, dopamine and oxytocin, these neurotransmitters and other endorphins. And your brain doesn't actually know that you're not smiling when you see a smile. It actually thinks that you are smiling. And so this reaction happens. 
And we know that when you're in that state or place, your brain starts to behave really differently. And we know from Dr. Barbara Fredrickson's work at the University of North Carolina with her broaden and build theory, that you actually then have a greater repertoire, you're more resourceful, you make more accurate decisions faster, you're more creative, you, your actual peripheral vision expands. And so one of our intentions is to have the viewers just in this state, in this state where their brain is just being nourished and so they have the ability to not resist or reject the content, but allow it to bypass that conscious critical judgment factor of that prefrontal cortex. And it can go in and the seeds are planted in the superconscious and we go beyond this conscious aspect where we know everything and we have this insatiable appetite to be right because it was part of our survival instinct. And that's just one aspect of our formula. And I love, I love, love, love these kinds of conversations, JW, because yes, it's very simple. It's so simple and beautiful. And most people don't really understand the sophistication of what's actually going on for their benefit to their advantage, you know? Yeah, and I think, uh, and I think the more this information gets out about what you're doing from this neurobiological, the scientific, because here's the problem. Um, matter of fact, I was a good friend of mine. I was on a on a, uh, a seminar things with Success Resources, and you know Robert Kiyosaki. He was there, and a, you know a bunch of other you know kind of market leaders, and they had a guy come in that hypnotized the audience, and mm. um, and he had made people you know quack like a duck and do crazy things. And this is, um, and so um, what we now know is that the brain um, really wants to have more of this learning, which is at the, it's when you go into the woods and you take a walk, how do you feel when you come out? You're a different human, right? You go to the beach, right? You're one with something. You're not trying to get anything done. It's just, I'm just there, one with what's happening. That's very similar to what we're doing here. We're not trying to make you do anything or be anything. All we're doing is to sit still and watch this and see what happens. And so, so we don't have any resistance for me or with the system trying to do something. All we have to do is sit back and let it happen. And in a way, this goes a little far out there. But another thing that's happening when we go into these more meditative states, it activates a thing called the ventral mental pre prefrontal cortex that makes us feel more one with everything. It's really where the spiritual part of our brain is, when we have those spiritual experiences. It's what, you know, the Dalai Lama and a bunch of these other institutes are researching the brain and they're finding these kinds of things. And so what you're doing is you're falling into this arena with positive prime, where you're exploring these other ways of learning that are very different and transformation that are very different than the traditional, I've got to stress to learn or change. Mm. Mm. Okay, so I am fascinated by um, the subject of gratitude. I'm often known or referred to as the queen of gratitude. I did of course write some best-selling books um, on the subject. I want to know from you, JW, how gratitude has shaped your life and the work that you do and how you bring it to life and how you express your appreciation. I just, I would love to dive into what are you grateful for? Why? What's the value of gratitude? And is that yet another one of these really beautiful states that we can savor? where the stress has gone down. And of course, we're in a much more receptive place for learning and for thriving and flourishing. Right. Um, so what's happened, sorry, a couple of messages show up on my screen. That's why I'm trying to, I'm not trying to jab you in the eye. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so let's go back to it. Um, what is gratitude the opposite of?
Mm. Anger, and anger and resentment. Yeah, wow. I was going to say anger and I thought, really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. So what's happening is, in why, you know why angry people stay angry? Because anger Cause they, incre it increases stress hormone, changes their cheddar cheese to Parmesan cheese, and they stay angry. They get angry mm -hmm. and angry. The more you get angry, the more you're going to get angry. Mm -hmm. The more you're sad, the more you're going to be sad. It's literally building neural tissue. So what gratitude does, and so anger, um, you know, resentment, all that stuff are these lower brain structures. There's a guy named McLean in the 1950s, McLean in the 1950s, came up with the triune brain theory. And basically, he's the guy that said, oh, your lower part of your brain is just like a reptile. The middle part is like, a, a, you know, a mammal's brain. And the human with the frontal lobe is the only one that had this big frontal lobe. Now, since then, it's not exactly right, but it's good enough, right? It's, it's a rough diagram of what's going on. So when I'm stressed, the blood flow in my brain literally shifts downward to my least evolved states to my least resourceful states. When I am guilty, angry, sad, all those things, I'm less depressed, I'm less resourceful. The reason depressed people can't figure out what to do tomorrow is because their blood flow is shifted away from the resource, resourceful part of their brain, which is in the upper brain areas. So what we, what we wanna do is we wanna be grateful for something. So, I'll just get, so my background is not too pretty. My parents were both drug addicts and alcoholics. And my father was accused of murdering my mother by some people, right? So, yeah, well, it, but, but it doesn't bother me now, right? Um, so what happened was by the time I was like nine or 10 years old, I was trying to run my house, um, which was a gift. Why can I develop 25 businesses? Well, when I had freaking 15,000 connections per neuron. I was trying to figure out how to make it all work. People call that, you know, it was codependent at the time, but I've tried to figure out how to survive in this mess, right? So I could take really bad situations and figure out how to make good things out of them. Now, I didn't know this at the time. I mean, I needed help, quite frankly. You know, I've been, I've been in more treatment centers for whatever was crazy with me than the average schmo. And so, you know, it's been to dinner. And so I was literally until my 40s, I was, you know, I was a nightmare. I loved to fight. You know, I'd been in jail. I'd done all sorts of stuff. And so, but I was an angry dude. And as I started, but I didn't want to live my life that way. And as I started going through the process of transformation in the 1980s, I stumbled into TM, Transcendental Meditation. Now, I'm not, I used to work on Madison Avenue and I was drinking a fifth a day. I was crazy. And um, I, I got the idea that, that, that meditation would cure my hangovers. So I can't say that I went into meditation from a spiritual place, but I sure didn't want those hangovers anymore. So I did. I did my TM twice a day. And all of a sudden, my acetylcholine went out. My cheese started to melt. And I started to look at what I just told you. God, I grew up in that house. And I learned how to deal with difficult. I mean, I'm great in crises. I learned to deal with crises really well. What a gift. My father was an alcoholic. You know, I, if you go on the web uh, under um, cracking the addiction code, I've done a video up there that explains why addicts are addicts and why we shouldn't hate them. I mean, why it's so hard for them to change. So I was able to come up with wonderful solutions to help people that were like me. And so I'm, I'm not angry at anybody. I'm grateful that I had a mother and a father like that. I'm grateful that I had a crazy childhood because like what you said, I would have never done this. You know, I would have never come up with, you know, spending 35 years to figure out how the brain works if I hadn't had that misery to bit begin with, turned it into gratitude and then figured out how can I share this with more people so they don't ever have to feel what I felt. That's just such a beautiful inhalation. You know, I never would have come up with Positive Prime had I not already been the best-selling author of a book on gratitude. But it wasn't that I was a best-selling author. It was 
that in order to substantiate or justify that title, I had to dive so deep into the research on the psychology of gratitude that it actually made me master the subject. And I'm insatiably curious. And so I dived even deeper and went down this rabbit hole into positive psychology and neuroscience and ah, voila. And all of my experiences, even my cardiac pacemaker, instead of being angry that it's inside my body, I knew that the only way forward for me was to be really peaceful about how extraordinary it is that I get to live and something else is keeping me alive. And making sure I don't have these unconscious episodes where I, you know, break my neck or um, lots of other terrible things that can happen from these types of falls. It's really for me, it's the it's the way that I continue to be. And everything, everything in my life has unfolded in the most miraculous and exquisite, cheerful, wonderful way. Because gratitude is this state that I cultivate and that I try to live in for as much of the day as possible every day, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, mm. yeah, we're, 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 you know, and so what we, transformation is a process and acceptance is a real gift. And so if we can accept what happens to, happened to us, and see how we can transform it to help ourselves and others grow. It just, it, it, it really that the stuff that caused this misery at one time is really gold that we can, we can use as an asset to help the world transform. Certainly, certainly the truth. <laughs> certainly, yeah. certainly the truth. Mm. Yeah, we're very lucky. Yeah, and so, but, but, we don't have enough people telling this story. We, you know, we may say that gratitude is important or, you know, low stress more, uh, hormones are important, but I think we need to tie it a little more to about how we not only transform ourselves, we were, you were talking about the noble cause, not only transform ourselves, but how we use our own transformation to transform this world, because mm. we don't have to have all this going on. You know, it, it's in Iraq, Iran, you know, wherever, you know, we're one side's against another in America with our politics. We, we don't have to be like this. And this against one another is stopping our species from being the wonderful, joyful earth that we could have. Well, and it's interesting because I think that one of the aspects of the work that we're doing is when we are at war with ourselves, when we have that inner critic whose voice is louder than that, you know, nurturing, loving guidance from our higher self, you know, quite frankly, the conflict out there is, is a reflection of the conflict within here. And one of the things I love about transformational learning, JW, and the, the journey that we invite people to come along on is that the more you learn that you can actually very gracefully and graciously transform completely, the more you can actually believe in a more peaceful planet, in an earth where we all actually do care for each other. You know, but we've got to believe that about ourselves, I think, first, or at least see enough evidence and then be out there contributing beyond ourselves to have the experience of our impact in order for that kind of meaning to then start this beautiful, you know, snowflake that becomes the avalanche. Yeah. And so you, you hit it, you hit it on the head. And, and so what we, so getting to the point where we're not resentful or angry for our past, but grateful because it's made us the human beings that we are that have, can have compassion and empathy for others like us. That's the shift that mm. we want to have. Mm. Absolutely. And the roles that we play in helping people to first of all, become aware that they could in fact be behaving like the victim and 
they're the ones that are actually continually then causing their own grief. And, and actually there is a brighter future for them with a brighter way of being. And quite frankly, it's anchored in learning more about how we actually go on these journeys. I think a lot of people, they intellectually want to be more peaceful. They just don't know how. No one's no, actually taking their hand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, helping them to learn. You know, I just want to go back to this cortisol thing, um, JW. A couple of years ago, I was um, watching Amy Cuddy's talk about the power pose, you know, the victory um, symbol and what happens then with adrenaline and our feelings of confidence and so forth. And I started thinking about um, biomarker testing and how sexy that was in these sciences. And I went back to the university that I had graduated from with my undergraduate to their school of medicine, it's called Bond University. And I asked for some assistance and I really wanted to test, does watching 15 minutes of a positive prime session actually change you and indeed your hormones? And so we started with only a few people um, in the room and we had everybody wake up at exactly the same time and not drink their coffee or drink their coffee at exactly the same time and then at exactly the same time of the day because circadian rhythms actually affect cortisol. We then had people, you know, put the stick and we got their saliva and there's this fancy machine and, uh, you know, Bond University School of Medicine was the only place there was one of these machines in Australia at the time. And we saw before and after with these tests that we were actually dramatically changing cortisol. And when we actually spoke to the, the company that was selling the consumables to do this research, and we said, wow, this is what we're seeing with cortisol. Do you know they didn't even believe that we could possibly be getting those kinds of results because apparently it's so difficult to rapidly change someone's cortisol levels. And maybe we'd not really done the testing accurately or appropriately or adequately. And there were all of these like, should we really allow people like Kim Serafini who isn't a researcher and not a scientist to actually play with these you know, fancy ideas? And so they actually sent us a whole host of more consumables and we had to rerun all of the experiments with lay people, real people, real people like you and me who have real opportunities and real lives and real challenges. And that's what, that's what interests me. And we saw all of the same things happen again. And then when I go and speak to learned neuroscientists about positive prime sessions and the formula and what's really going on. And we talk about the fact that, you know, we can literally change somebody's cortisol readings such that we've, we've literally put them in a place where they're not producing as much cortisol. There's not as much cortisol in their body. They're like, oh, not possible. Yeah, possible. So one of the beautiful things, JW, about this mission that you're on and this work is that I think it, it's not only cracking the code, it's cracking wide open. I think of, you know, um, the beautiful songs from Leonard Cohen about, you know, when the light shines through the crack, you're actually cracking wide open possibility. That for me, yeah. that's what yeah. learning yeah. is. And, and in a way, our typical corporate and training systems and even a lot of the online systems, because they're not using something that is helping our 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 biology learn quickly. We we, we I mean I, I don't know if you know this, but you know the average completion rate of an online program that somebody pays for. Oh, I've I've read things like people buy these at home study courses twenty years ago and they don't even open the cover. You know, it becomes um, <laughs> shelf help, not hey, self on. help. We used to call it I was in that, I worked at a company called, called the, uh, it, what was it called? Educational Discoveries. And we used to call them under the bed boxes because they buy, buy that big box or all of the CDs and the, and the VHS. And they, there's nowhere to put it. So they'd slide it under the bed. They'd look at one and that was it. But the question is yeah. why? Mm. You know, you can't sit in front, and this is what Zoom, at some level, something like this that's really meaningful to us, you and I could sit here all day in this, right? Because it's highly meaningful. But if you're trying to learn something new, 
and they're delivering it to you, just stand and deliver. It's really hard. That's why at the Institute, very similar to you, we've developed learning programs that are only three to seven minutes long. And it's not just information. We have you go out into the real world after you do it, after you get the information and do something that's only three to seven minutes long. And why is that? Because you were talking about it before, bouncing on that trampoline. What we tend to have thought, oh, let's put somebody in a classroom and have them learn. But you got to go back to evolutionary biology. You go back, you know, three billion years when the first, when the lightning hit the primordial ooze in the in the first molecules were made, right? Up until really the first, you know, school systems in the 1700s, how did man do all of his learning? Moving through time and space in the real world. That's how every organism learns. We decided to activities, do no, 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 no. activities, exercises, exercise, you know, like doing well, it's, things. It's, yeah, we've got this weird concept that that um, the brain is separate from the body, right? And and I think that Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. He couldn't have been wrong. It's I feel, therefore I am. You can't have a thought without a change in your blood pressure, your heart rate, your digestive enzymes, your, your liver enzymes. Literally, learning is a physiological process. When you take the body out of the learning process, you dampen down the whole friggin' system. Now you can jack it up with me. I mean, we're having a good time talking about this because it's meaningful to us. But in what you were doing by jumping on that, that little trampoline thing while you were, you were learning, you were basically doing what the body needed. Your bo the body needs to be engaged in the learning process, not all the time, but as much as possible. And here's what happens. So let's say I'm a scientist that's looking through a test tube. Well, that's a form of action. It may not be in the classroom, and it, you know, but uh, my body's involved. You know, the interesting thing about the more meaningful the information, the greater the learning, is that when there's high meaning, there's high body involvement, whether we want it or not. We can be sitting still, but my blood pressure is changing, my destiny, all the, all my all my markers, my eyes are dilating, all sorts of my galvic skin response are all changing. So what we've done is we've taken the very thing that needs to happen to create learning in our educational systems and body. We said, forget it. We're going to use Descartes. We're, we're going to use Descartes. I think therefore I am, which doesn't work. Yes, well, you know, we could have this conversation um, last, quite frankly, for hours and hours and hours. Um, thank you so very much, JW. I would love to encourage everybody, no matter who you are, where you are and what you're doing right now, go and actually take the action to buy JW's book when it arrives. Have this beautiful, fun experience of opening it and maybe just read one chapter and see if it captivates you. And then maybe just read another chapter. Or maybe well, they just- They only gotta read five pages. They only gotta read five pages after the first three chapters. You don't even have to read the whole chapters. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you know what I love is that literally just opening the cover and just reading one page to get yourself started, that's actually the easiest way to get any of us to do anything. Just the tiniest little thing. Just do the tiniest little thing and see if you can get yourself into some momentum. And I've noticed that if you just, if you just can convince yourself to do the tiniest little thing and then you get into the flow and ah, voila, all of a sudden you've done the thing. But if you'd have actually made this decision that you had to do the thing, whatever the big thing is, you actually scare yourself into just the tiniest first step. Just the yeah, tiniest well, first what, step. What's that? I forget who it was, uh, that, that uh, Chinese proverb, you know, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Yeah, and, absolutely. And the, and the thing is, you don't want to poke your cheese. You don't want to have to read this whole freaking tome overnight. Just read a little bit at a time. Put it by your bed, read a page, put it by the toilet, wherever you are. And then all of a sudden, you're going to start to see 
your view of yourself in the universe will, will start to shift. And, you know, they can go to our website and look at a lot of videos there, too, to get a, a deeper understanding, too, of that direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, we thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been wonderful. And I can't wait for more really great conversations like this and maybe even in person soon. Yeah, that would be great. Big, 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 big hug. Thank you very much. And back to you.